All right. Well, I have, uh, <clears throat> I have 2.15 on my clock, so we'll go ahead and get started here. So we are obviously here for web user experience in 2020. That's been on the screen long enough that hopefully you found that this is the right room for you and where you're wanting to go. Um, so, um, you know, like as I proposed this talk back months ago, I, I was really excited about it. And the closer I got to it, the more I really spent time thinking about like, what on earth am I doing? Proposing, we're, here we're talking about the web in 2020. But, um, but we're going to do this, we're going to make a, uh, and we're going to refine what I think is happening because that's the way open source works. Um, so just a little bit about myself, very briefly. I started off in the web as a developer, late 90s, uh, grew a team, became a CEO, uh, ended up creating a product along the way. And uh, now I work at Pantheon where I do agency and community outreach that gives me a chance to talk to lots of people in the industry, go to a lot of conferences, etc. Um, I'm D Gorton on Twitter, and that is enough of a bio, frankly, about me. If you're interested, you can Google it or whatnot. Uh, so much of what I'm talking about, though, is really due to the credit of others. I've been spending a lot of time doing reading, research, and uh, it's heavily influenced by others. And, and so uh, I'm giving lots of, uh, lots of quotes throughout the, uh, through the, throughout the talk that uh, hopefully get you off to these other people who I think are really doing some really interesting sort of thinking about what's going on. The three-minute version, if you want to just like grab it right now, uh, is that the world is getting more webbish. Everything is getting much more interconnected. Um, that's happening and it's going to accelerate. At the same time, the web is getting less webbish. The web that we know and understand and looks like websites are, are going to be less website-y. Um, there's a lot of change coming, and, uh, but I think we can be optimistic about that. Open source won this last time. And I think for the kinds of skills that we have as human beings to put us in this room here at DrupalCon in New Orleans in 2016, this room full of people has the skills to, to take advantage of all of this change that's coming and help drive it to the places that we want it to go. Um, so I'll be talking about, so the things that I'll be talking about uh, are like these forces that are changing the medium, uh, hardware, the open web, software as a service, uh, things in search and social. And uh, an awareness of those and some possible outcomes of things that I think will happen, but I want everyone hopefully to be aware of all of these forces and come to your own conclusions as, as, as makes sense. Um, I'm not going to be talking about UI design techniques uh, or user experience, sort of like processes, uh, techniques, content strategy, etc. Um, so if you're looking for those things, I won't be offended. You know, there's a lot of great talks you can go, you know, check out, check out the other ones. Um, in each force, I'm going to talk about what, what's happening, what's going on, give an analogy or an example, uh, uh, and then my prediction, and then what I think we ought, 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 all of us ought, ought to be doing in order to prepare for it. So uh, I thought I'd just start off with, however, uh, some, some sort of level setting here. Uh, there have been a lot of people who have gone uh, out of their way to sort of predict the future, and, uh, and, and they're not always right. Thomas Edison. Uh, about uh, alternating current, which is what we're using right now around us all the time. 1989, he thought it was no chance ever. Uh, 1955, this person ran a uh, vacuum cleaner company, and this is pretty much where he thought things were headed. Um, the Digital Equipment Corporation, you know, it's kind of like a big uh, beast, right? We've probably all seen this. Uh, no reason for an individual to have a computer in their home. Wow, I mean, like, that's... Pretty far off, and this is from somebody who should have been future looking. Um, uh, this guy invented Ethernet. Uh, 3Com, huge networking thing. In 1995, he thought the whole thing was done in 96. Um, we're looking out four years, and we've all perhaps heard of this as well. Mr. Balmer saying that the iPhone is the silliest thing, it's never going to get market share. Uh, that was in 2007, soon after it came out. I likewise. <laughs> I'm probably going to say something really dumb. <laughs> Hopefully it's just one, but we'll find out in 2020. Uh, and another, just sort of like, again, level setting. Uh, uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing some things by way of analogy, uh, because I think that can be helpful. But as, as uh, Mr. Freud points out, really, you know, they may or may not be relevant. So <coughs> let's go. So uh, in 2020, Moore's law will be broken. It's already slowing down. This is not that dramatic of a prediction, but I think it has a lot of impacts. And I'm starting all the way down 
at this hardware level. Moore's law is the thing that was, uh, it, it's called a law, but it should not be called a law. Laws are like so, supposed to be for different things. But anyways, it was invented or, or coined, the term was coined in uh, 1965 by someone who was a co-founder of Intel. And the, the law is that every year, things will get twice as fast, that that's what's going to happen. This sort of evolution of speed on computer hardware and chips is going to just keep doubling. Um, how many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Right? Okay, good, right. So um, it's, it's not going to hold. A lot of what we do today is predicated on this ever-increasing speed. And I think it sort of trickles throughout the ecosystem in interesting ways. Uh, in ways that we don't appreciate. Like here we are, we do web design, we do these things in the web, or like PHP and CSS, like, like PHP is a long ways away from the, the transistors. Yet, again, it all flows through the system. I think there's two reasons that Moore's law will, will, will be broken. Uh, one is physics, and, and that's just, uh, you know, like that's kind of the way things are. Right now, uh, we're down to sort of the nanometer scale. Uh, a chip, like the, the, you need 14 nanometers. That's not very many. At about five nanometers, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle comes into play, and you, know, you just have no idea what's going on. So you can't get, like just physically, you just cannot get much smaller. But I think a more interesting reason that this will break is that things are getting to the point of good enough. And for an analogy, uh, we're going to look at the airplane industry. So um, in the 1930s, there was the DC-3. In the 1940s, the Strata Cruiser came out. Um, 1950s, there was the 707, and the 1960s, Pan Am created the Fly to the Moon Club, the first moon flights club, because it was pretty much obvious that within about 10 years, you were going to be able to fly to the moon. This whole thing was ever accelerating. And this is actually, uh, this analogy comes by way of, I should, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm not sure, but you're my, you know. So this gentleman, uh, gave this talk in 2014 uh, in New Zealand, um, and the, the link down there will take it to you. It's a great, you can, you know, go read the whole thing. But uh, the point is, uh, well, that didn't happen, right? We do not start flying to the moon. Uh, everyone was working on supersonic, and that was going to be the next jump after the, the, uh, the 707, and uh, all of the great engineers in the world were working on it, and it, it just kept on being delayed. I don't know if anybody's ever been on a project that's delayed constantly, they, they had to, uh, they had like the, the, the B team step in, peel off and say like, look, this project is behind, we're going to build the stopgap. Uh, and that was the 737. And that is basically the same airplane we're all still flying in today. It's slightly bigger, now 747, but you know like these, the, the numbers get a little bit more, but basically it's the same thing. Airplane travel got to the point where it was good enough. The problems of getting it faster we're just not, we're not worth the costs of doing it. Um, and that same thing is happening in the hardware space. So we have some pretty amazing, I mean like we all, here's my phone, right? We all know the analogy of like, your phone is better than the, the whole thing that the, the, uh, the astronauts were in on the way to the moon, right? We have a lot of computing power here. Um, so ubiquity is going to be much more, is much more important than speed. Or, or, or will, be, will be happening. The focus on speed um, is no longer what will be driving things. Uh, efficiency, like how many of us have battery problems on our phones already? Like those, the, the next problems are not speed. Um, they're going to be specialized chips for specialized problems. So solving very difficult math problems, for example, or doing image recognition and other things. So there's going to be like a, the, the new sort of uh, innovations in chips are going to be around very specialized uh, problems. And that's going to lead to mass-produced specialized devices. And we know about this. This is the Internet of, th of Things. But it's here and it's accelerating. And I'm actually kind of curious, like how many of us uh, in the room have one plus, one or more uh, Internet-connected devices on them right now? One or more. Two or more. Keep holding. Two or more. Three or more. Okay. Four or more. Okay, actually, I thought three, but I actually have a, I, I realized as I was preparing, I have four, but because I have a Kindle lying around. Um, anyway, and somebody else might have one too. Like, you don't even remember that this thing is connected, right? Why, like, if you were to go back five years ago and say, like, here we are, let's talk, this is 2012, we're going to talk about the web in 2016, uh, the idea that you would have four, three, 
multiple devices connected to the internet, that would be silly. Like, why would you do that? Why? You, there, there's, why would you do There's no need for that. Um, like, it's just going to be much more ubiquitous. So this is going to accelerate and increase, and you're not even going to think about the fact that they're necessarily internet connected, right? Like, again, my own personal example, I sort of forgot that the, the Kindle counts. Um, but there are other things, too. And we're going to see much, much more of that. So again, the, uh, what to do about this? Well, this is OK. Uh, again, like this, is, all right, so this is like way happening down deep. The world is getting more webbish, though. Like we're going to see these connections between phone and computer and other things, right? We know this world. We understand what it means to be interconnected. We're building systems that talk to other systems right now at our levels. Um, and our webbish sort of kung fu is strong. Um, and so I think we should, we should sort of go into this with some, some optimism, this new changing landscape, and realize, again, like the skills that we've got are ones that uh, are going to be very highly valued moving forward. Um, and I, I do want to kind of reinforce that, because some of the rest of this, like, there's a lot of change coming, and, and that can be scary, frankly. Um, so all of those devices are going to have interfaces, right? Um, some of them are going to be interfaces that talk to humans. Other, you know, a lot of them are going to be the thing, you know, like Nike's shoes. How many people uh, saw Dries's keynote yesterday? Um, I'm actually, I'd like to play just like a very brief snippet out of it. Um, so this is a screenshot from it. And it's a prototype that actually was made. And we'll see if it's still queued up. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to voice over this. So um, I was thinking that would come through better, but it's not. So anyways, Dries is introducing this as a concept. Uh, this is a, a, a grocery store near him that the, uh, I think it was perhaps made up. Here's Dries sitting, talking to Alexa and saying, I want to know what's on sale. Like, how many, tell me about the groceries that are available nearby. <sighs> oh, right, so we could all huddle around the projector. Oh, oh. See, this is open source. Yeah, yeah get the other. So can someone grab the other microphone? I'll pause. Can someone grab the other microphone and just bring it over there? I'll cue this back up. Gourmet market. Gourmet market. Right? And Gourmet market is a Drupal 8 user, but they also want their customers not only to be able to use the website, but also to use Echo as well as push notifications and some of these things that I just talked about. So we built this in Drupal 8, and we recorded a demo of it. So I'm going to show you the demo. Uh, in the demo, I played a customer. All right? Let's see if it works. Ask Gourmet Market when fruits are on sale today. Ask Gourmet Market when fruits are on sale today. What's your zip code so I can locate the nearest one? What's your zip code so I can locate it? 042. Zip code? Apples, so, such and such, bananas, such and such. Anything else I can help with? Uh, these are awesome sauce and soup. All right, so slows it down here. And what's happening behind the scenes? So again, like this is the interface to a website, right? How many of you have ever thought about the interface that you design your website that looks like this? It doesn't look like anything. So Drupal is talking back to the back end system. Coming back, queries, 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 queries. Awesome sauce isn't on sale right now, but I'll notify you when it is. What is your phone number? Uh, right. Alexa comes back with the results. Not on sale right now. What's your phone number? You need your phone number. It's not actually his real phone number. Great. I'll, I'll let you know when awesome uh, sauce is on sale. And uh, and so, all right, I'll, I'll notify you as soon as it's on sale. And now uh, somebody goes into the website, goes checks the box. It's on sale. So um, that is one example of, of the way that the web is changing. Um, 
There are other interfaces coming as well, right? We have, uh, so before, before Dries stole my thunder, um, I, I was going to be talking about overlay, actually. So uh, how many of us remember the Google Glass, right? Did anybody here get one? That's cool, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know somebody else who has one, really enjoyed it. There was a little bit of a backlash against it. How many people have seen, like, virtual reality uh, kind of headsets and such? Has anybody had a chance to try one? It's kind of, like, so for those of you who have, you know, like, just, like, yes, no, compelling? Yeah, I think large, highly compelling. Uh, if you haven't gone to, go, like, um, I'm going to tell you about drone racing. Um, and I will just say, like, if you have not seen drone racing YouTube videos, you should look at them. It's very interesting. It's a, it's, uh, it's a very exciting sport, effectively, that's going to be happening. Um, somewhere between the Google Glass and this big clunky thing you're wearing on your head, there will be, it will, it will, it will go somewhere between the two. And augmented reality, as it's often been called, will start happening. And again, like, the ability to walk by that same marketplace, look at it and see, apples are on sale. Um, that same kind of interface is going to be happening. Um, and this is also, again, APIs. There will still be screens, um, I think. It's not that far away. But uh, more and more, the things that we are producing will be put out in very dramatically different uh, mediums. Um, and. And we know, so just you know, like looking at an analogy, something from our own experience, right? Uh, we know that there will need to be a single place for the information to be stored, right? How many people remember the, view, the bad mobile site days, right? Whereas, like, here's the regular website, and here's the other website that has some of the things, but not the ones you're looking for. Um, the optimized experience. And here we are. This is actually from 2014. We know that this is a, a fail. Like, you... Uh, you will have a single place that stores all of the information. Nobody wants to maintain it multiple places. And that single place is going to look a lot like Drupal. Um, so, what to do about this? Like, that's a little bit daunting. If you do this stuff professionally, you should be looking at headless Drupal. How many people, uh, I say headless Drupal, how many people have started using, building things that are headless Drupal sites? Cool. All right. Hopefully, by next year, you can all raise your hands. I really think you ought to be doing it. Um, increasingly, you should be building things that have integrations and APIs. Do projects, find projects, seek them out. Get ahead of this curve, right? Seek out projects that can push your content elsewhere. Push it out to mobile devices, push it out to wherever. Um, start talking to systems. So if you've already started this, congratulations. Good. Double down. Do more of it. Uh, these skills are going to be in super high demand. If you haven't already, it's okay. I mean, I mean, we're all busy, and this hopefully is this conference, and one of the things we do at a conference, we sort of open our minds and think about what's, what's coming. Um, it's not too late, but start, start moving. Start, start doing it. Um, the open web. There's been a lot of blogging recently about the open web, and that's the concept that uh, the web, as we remember it from the you know the early 2000s, is is going away, um, and uh, you know like the old experience of being able to sort of like uh, serendipitously like sort of find interesting content uh, is becoming harder and harder. And more and more of our journeys start with Facebook or Google uh, or Apple or other other places, and and so people a lot of people have been blogging like what's the role of Drupal in a world that has these huge giants sort of bubbling up. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think the open web will win, but it's going to look very different. Um, and the reason I think the open web will win is because, uh, again, sort of looking back to, we've seen this before. Uh, the browser wars happened in the late 1990s, uh, right? And uh, the, the two things, the, it, was, it was just two giants that we were sort of caught between. It was Netscape and Internet Explorer. Neither of them so big a factor today. Um, <laughs> Internet Explorer started pulling ahead. In the meantime, the Web Standards Project came out and said, this is ridiculous. I do not want to build JavaScript 13 different, well, two different ways, and have this, you know, like, I, in order for this site to look and behave the same, I have to code it basically twice. It was ridiculous. And our industry uh, basically started stamping our feet and said, no, no more of this. 
Uh, the browser, you know, they kind of ignored it a little bit. They're like, well, this is kind of interesting, but we've got our own ideas. Why would we pay attention? As soon as IE started pulling away, Netscape came to the rescue and said, actually, we've been about this the whole time. This is what we were hoping to do as well. And so I think this same thing is going to happen with the open web. I think, um, so Google is pushing formats. Facebook is pu pushing formats. Um, I don't think we need to sweat those. I'm not saying ignore them, but don't, uh, I don't think we should also be worried that you have to do every single one. If you need to for a project, so accelerated mobile pages, has anyone here done an accelerated mobile pages project? At least some people, yeah, I know. I, you guys have done some great work on it, some very cool work on it. Oh, that's that. Uh, FI, Facebook, instant articles, thank you, All right? Um, there will be other formats. They will come out, it will happen. Um, don't ignore them, educate yourself on them, but also, they're probably going to be a little bit faddish. Um, and I would say help build an open web movement. Like again, we've, uh, we, we need it. One of the things I spent some time on as I was preparing these slides was trying to come up with a name for this. I spent too much time on that, in fact, actually. And I just left it with open web movement. Um, so uh, help build that, help create that. We know how to do that sort of thing. Uh, and some more support it as it emerges as well. Um, big data in 2020. So Edward Snowden, uh, it was actually three years ago that this happened, right? Massive leak uh, of basically US government malfeasance, like the government digging into all of our privacy, doing a lot of stuff, just the, the amount of data that it was gathering was, was obnoxious, right? This caused repercussions around the world and continues to do so. Um, just last month, the European Union came out and declared that everyone has the right to the protection of their personal data. Um, this, the, the EU is ahead of us in many ways in sort of uh, in data protection and privacy. But the idea that data belongs to the person, not the organization that collects it, is definitely like that is where we're headed. Um, and I think rightly so. And I think in 2013, we saw Edward Snowden with, with, uh, with the US government. Facebook and Google and Amazon have Edward Snowden's embedded inside of them, right? There is somebody that at some point in time, you know, step forth, right? The amount of data that's being collected by, like, there is so much of it, someone else will at some point step forth and say, like, here's what's going on at this company. Um, I believe that will happen. And if it doesn't happen via an Edward Snowden inside of one of those companies, uh, here's a picture of the information hack, like the, uh, the data breaches that have happened in just the last while. This is a, from a site called informationisbeautiful.net. Um, 2014 at the bottom, uh, latest things, you know, 80 million records, 191 million records. Mossack Fonseca, like uh, up there in the top, that's quite recent. Uh, more and more data will come out and more and more outreach is gonna grow. Like, that's not, it's not cool, right? How much of our, personal lives are being tracked in, in ways. European Union is, is, is ahead here. Uh, and um, so what do we do about that? Again, this is sort of like at the theoretical level, but support data privacy standards as, as they're emerging. Um, and I would say here, specifically, all of us in this room who build sites for clients, be aware that we're a part of that chain too. So get educated on security. Um, Web security is a real thing. There were a couple talks here yesterday. There are more this week. Um, and really protect personally identifiable information. Uh, we all have a responsibility. Make sure that you, your future self, is in a safe place when it, does, when, when it sort of comes to things like liability. But then also, uh, just do the right thing. Um, it's very approachable, too. If, how many of us would like to raise our rates? Oh, really? All right. If you, if you became the security people, you have a differentiator, right? If you are working at a, at a firm or an agency that is all about security, um, or has that a very strong thing, that's a definite dif differentiator. And uh, again, it's the right thing to do, but it's also a good thing for business. In 2020, software, 
<clears throat> is going to, is, is, you know, it's growing already, but it's just going to keep accelerating. Um, software as a service in particular is going to grow and get bigger. More and more services are going to be commoditized. Uh, and I think search and social will be regulated. So software as a service is, um, well, let's, let's actually, uh, let's look at the, uh, the, the, the screenshot here. So services commoditized and search and social are regulated. Um, so here's a Google for primary results from, oh, I don't know, about a month or two ago. And you'll see that rather than, you know, coming back with news stories, right, it's giving you the actual results and a very nice, easily accessible, this is a great user experience. Like I typed it in, I got uh, feedback instantly. It tells me who's ahead, what the things are. I can scroll down, click in for more, for more information. Uh, Google is heavily incented to, to, to produce these great user experiences. It's going out, scouring the, 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 the web for all of the information it can, presenting it back in the nicest way that it can. Um, to the extent, that, uh, and actually I'm going to just jump ahead to another more concrete example. Uh, this is a restaurant near me in Minnesota. Uh, Thai Curry House, great food. Highly recommended if you're ever in the neighborhood. Um, their website is kind of lousy. When I Google that, you know, when I Google Thai Curry House, I want to know, are they open today? Uh, I want to know maybe their phone number so I can call ahead and do a reservation. Um, and uh, when I'm doing, you know, like when I, if I'm not familiar with it, it's great to like see examples of the food and uh, maybe what's on the menu. That's all available over here uh, in the Google view. Over here on the left side is their actual website. The phone number is actually a picture of the phone number. That's terrible. I can't, if I'm on my mobile, I can't, I actually have to remember it and like come back to the number. Like, uh, don't take a picture of text, it breaks the internet. Um, uh, that's, that is, a, that is, I mean, like, that's, that's a great user experience, but as people who build websites, that's also alarming. What do we do with this? Uh, and here's what I think we need to do. Like, to the extent that you have commoditizable clients, like menus, movie listings, other things like that, uh, again, you need to either get out of it, like, don't serve those clients, or go deep. And you can choose which way, uh, but... You have it, you know, make the choice rather than have it be made for you. Uh, and, and by deep, what I mean is you're going to need to understand all of the things about ha being a restaurant and really help them. Help them forecast demand. Usually, you know, first day of the month, you normally see more people or what, whatever it is. Like, understand what they do deeply. Help them order supplies. Help them with uh, mobile ordering. Maybe somebody's walking by. They can, like, hey, that smells great. Make it really easy for somebody to order things on their phone. Um, so specialize, find a vertical and don't uh, understand it deeply and don't make yourself easily displaceable. Again, the world is getting webbier, the web less so, right? And I'm realizing I'm, I'm just burning through time. I knew that we would have uh, time for questions and such, but we're going to be there soon. So let's talk about web design. Um, design itself again, like, is going across, I think, a lot of, again, a lot of interfaces, but to the extent that we're looking at it on a screen, uh, be it, you know, this big or that big or some other size, um, we're, we're at a phase right now where we're seeing uh, more widgetization, right? And this, again, the web still is actually very webby in that we're embedding pieces from different places, right? We're seeing, you know, the Twitter embed is a simple example, but, like, there are pieces being embedded across websites constantly, and that will grow and increase. Uh, one of the opportunities, again, I think for all of us is the fact that that can slow things down, uh, and there is going to be a huge, as the demand grows for those things, the demand to do it quickly and efficiently and securely will likewise be there. Huge opportunities for people in this room. Um, uh, the actual trend, uh, so things like, so that's what I mean by the widgetization. Uh, is, is there and increasing. Microformats and web components are examples of this, where we see uh, like these very small, tight things, little components that can be shared around between sites. Um, I think visually, um, this, is a, this is a very compelling article uh, written by uh, a guy whose name I forget, but the URL is there. Um, and I should also say, 
the, the slides will be posted on the, um, uh, on this uh, node for the, for the uh, I'll do that actually maybe when we get to, to questions, example, uh, questions and answers so you can actually go check these things out. In any case, he makes a really interesting analogy sort of tracking the history of web design to uh, uh, where we are, like to architecture. It starts off with classical and Romanesque and, and uh, whoops, and not Romanesque twice. Uh, typo on the slides. Uh, but basically that these are in phases. And right now, we're in Renaissance, based on, again, like the sort of like the clean lines and the, the way things look. And I think it's actually very interesting to look ahead and say uh, Baroque and neoclassical are coming. And I think there's actually something to that. Um, again, like all of this stuff, screens are not going away. There are going to be some interesting trends. Baroque is much more flowery, and I think like things like CSS shapes are going to you know, come soon, um, let's say 2017, 2018. And then it'll be sort of like a return to much more simpler things uh, coming not long after that, neoclassical. Um, one of the things that I think this medium has constantly taught me, and I hope you know, we all remember, is that uh, this is a humbling medium to work in, right? So user experience always belongs to the future, the future user. And you don't know how they're going to be accessing things, and, um, and, and we need to be aware that the way that we do it now is, is, is ephemeral. And while, how people experience it years from now uh, is going to be the way it is experienced, right? Uh, and so rather than like tightly trying to control things and really going for you know, something that's very precious, being very much more open with the way that we do things and knowing that I'm not sure exactly how this is going to be used. I'm just going to try and make it as usable as it possibly can be right now. So what's the role of open source in all of this? So again, uh, we know how to do this. This, we deeply understand what it, what it means to be an interconnected world. Like, we know that's what we do all the time. We know how things fit together. We know we design experiences. We build systems. We know how these things could and should fit together. That's an opportunity. And, and our futures might involve sort of jumping out of some of the boundaries that we're in right now. But these skills that we've built to get here are tremendously valuable and absolutely what the world will need. We also know how to make ideas better, right? Open source won the web, right? We can do this again. Like, the world is changing, but open source runs the web. And that, that is come for, the, you know, come for the code, stay for the people. It's, I think a lot of that is about the way cultures of, of open source communities work, right? The way in which we know how to iterate on ideas, share them, improve them, and make them better. Uh, I think we also have a role to play in uh, assembling around some causes that are needed. So uh, data privacy standards amongst them. Um, and we also like building things. We like making things. We're going to push this technology further. The, uh, has anyone, after seeing Dries' uh, keynote, has anyone yet installed the Alexa module on a Drupal site, a uh, Drupal A site? I have not, but I'm kind of excited, right? Like, this is a bright new future. There's there's a lot of stuff there, um, and we can help make all of those things happen. So, again, the world is getting more webbish. Everything we do is going to be more deeply connected to everything else around it. At the same time, the web that we know today is going to be less webbish. It's less like the website of that Thai curry house, uh, and that's okay. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity for all of us as that future happens. And that is what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. So happy for questions. And, um, and I also, like having been the person talking for a while, uh, I do believe that people in this room have insights here. And so I would encourage a conversation as well. So, um, we can do questions for a little bit, but then maybe it turns into a boff sort of format after that.
Oh yeah, and if you, I'm sorry. If you do have a question, please come up to the mic so they can be recorded for, uh, for, for future attendees. Yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, it's right in the middle. Thank you, yeah. I recently used a uh, VR headset that came uh -huh. with my Samsung, uh -huh. um, and my question is, is it, like, what do you think it can be used for that's more practical and useful versus much of what I see on it, which is more like fun and games, but how do you see it being used for maybe a tool, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, so... I don't know, and I think that's a little bit like predicting the nuclear-powered vacuum cleaner. Like, um, we, I think we can have a sense for it. Um, uh, my sense is that it will look like something more like Google Glass. Like, again, right now it's a very big, clunky, restricting kind of thing. Like the Oculus Rift, you've got, you know, like you're tethered, don't move too far. Um, uh, but as this gets smaller and lighter and more efficient and, again, ubiquitous, these kinds of things, these kinds of devices, like chips that will make this easier and require less stuff around, um, I think it will look a lot more like the overlay on the world. And it might be very, you know, like, um, might be like, for example, medical professionals. While you're doing surgery, you're going to see something where you're like, I, you know, like you're in here, there's maybe a little heads up sort of thing saying like, oh, watch out for that artery. Uh, yeah. Or whatever it is. Uh, hopefully they know that already. But you know, like, you know, probably more helpful would be like interesting, you know, characteristics of this artery. That looks like it could be some kind of condition. You should be aware of that. Maybe that's aware of the system then and says, "Hey, wow, uh, anesthesiologist, you might need to adjust something here because of what we're seeing inside this." Um, and so it could be both instructive as well as um, sharing. Right. So definitely AR is more. Uh, I think so. Okay. But, you know, go back to the quotes. Uh, I'm sure I said at least one dumb thing. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Gordon. Hey, man. Thank you for this presentation. It's pretty awesome. Thank you. So, uh, one of the first things you talked about was um, the, the hardware side of things. And I've been a pretty avid follower of the advances recently in quantum computing. Yes. Where, which basically promises tenfold increases yep. or logarithmic increases in uh, computing power. Yeah. Um, as Drupal development companies, how should we prepare for this today? I, um, okay, so here's maybe my stupid thing. I don't think it's going to take off. I think, I think, again, we're at good enough. And I think what we're going to be, so uh, chip manufacturers, um, so I should say this. Um, it will exist. It will come. And I think there's other things, too, like sort of like DNA processing and other things, like some really interesting things happening out there in the forefront of computers. But I think uh, what chip manufacturers have come up with today to get us to this point is pretty good. And displacing that out of sort of very specialized things, um, very specialized use cases where you're doing incredibly heavy processing, you're, you're not going to have the investment in the industry uh, in order to produce that kind of uh, hardware on any scale for anything less than billions and billions of dollars. Uh, and I think that investment is going to be very hard to make when, you know, I'm looking for cats, right? Um, uh, so it may happen. That's why, you know, like I only went to 2020, you know, like, you know. But I think it's, I think it's further out before there's any, any real serious impact uh, okay. around us. So I have another question if I... Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. other, does anybody mind me? Um, so, uh, I've worked on one uh, decoupled uh, website, mm -hmm. and frankly, I think the developer just wanted to decouple it. I don't think there was really any compelling reason for them to do so, which is, which is fine. Sometimes you just do those things. But the, um, uh, the trouble that I ran into was the discovery side of content, um, which is uh, you know, how difficult that decoupling made it for me to get that content indexed in Google and other search methodologies. So my <laughs> question is, as we move further away, the web moves further away from you know, being webby, where you get these maybe audio interfaces, um, how is discovery of, say, knowing that I could ask that my, even if my local grocery store has bananas on sale today, right. you know, uh, becomes like it's 
how do I, how am I going to, how are we all going to figure this stuff out? You know, how's my mother-in-law going to figure out that she can talk to her phone and it's going to tell her these things? So one of the things that um, uh, Google pretty early on, maybe not, not that early on, but maybe five or six years ago, I, I watched a presentation at Bad Camp and they talked about the, the door, the sliding door at, uh, in, in the yeah. Google, you've heard this analogy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you know, in their cafeteria, they have a sliding door that automatically opens and then they have a manual door that you have to pull open, but sometimes the sliding door doesn't work and so everybody uses the manual door because you don't want to be the guy that walks into the sliding door, right? I mean, so if you don't trust that, that it's going to be there. Yeah. Well, we're all using Siri and stuff today, and, but, you know, and I know Siri has all these new capabilities, but I still pretty much just ask her to call my wife for me, right? right. So uh, how are we going to be able to embed discovery into the development process? Sorry, very long-winded question. Yeah, but so discovery of how these, like, yeah, so as all of this bewildering technology happens around us, how will we know what it can do? Um, is kind, maybe, sort of. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I really think it's gradual. I mean, like, uh, and again, I think it's environmental. And, I, and, and it will happen, uh, but, but for this, all I can do is sort of look to the past, again, maybe to that, uh, how many of us would have made any sense of the fact that you would have multiple devices on your person connected to the internet? Again, just go back, I don't think, is it five years? Is five years far enough for, for that to be a, a weird thing? It's maybe, maybe 10. 10 for sure. Um, yet now, we take it for granted. And I think, I think that that same kind of evolution is happening. Uh, as we see Siri, we see our friend do it, we see somebody, like again, like how do we learn anything in life? Mm -hmm. You know, like you, you see somebody, you ask, oh, how'd you do that? Or you read a blog post about it. And I think, um, I, again, that's a lot of the ubiquitousness that I think is going to be ever more all around, it's just here. It's like, like I wear clothing, I have these devices, you know, like it's not that special. Um, I don't know, you. does anybody else have, have opinions on that? You can step up to the mic and share them, certainly. All right, another question, yeah. I don't have opinions on that, but I definitely agree that I, I can never remember what I need to say to ask my Alexa for a quote of the day, so that's a really interesting question. Um, you had a, a term that you mentioned earlier called uh, open web, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if I quite understood that. Did you mean like uh, more open source? Uh, oh. You had four large companies out there. Right. Do, do you mind this just... guy? Yeah. Okay. So I would say so first and foremost, this actually came out of a a uh, this is a nice image that Dries had. He had, he gave a presentation at South by Southwest, so it comes from that. So there's a lot of uh, uh, so I'll give you a short answer, but I would just say if Google the term open web and you'll see a lot of people writing about it right now, um, including people like Dries or Matt Mullenweg, uh, who's the uh, Dries equivalent in WordPress. Um, and it's the idea that, um, that once upon a time, we all had these little websites uh, and, and you would sort of hop back and forth to these websites. And it was just like a lot, it was wide open, open in sort of like the, you know, like broad frontier kind of web. Uh, and the closed web, the opposite of open web, is more about the fact that there's these walled gardens coming up. So Facebook wants to hold all of the content. It wants to grab the content from you. Google kind of wants to do this. Google's like in an interesting spot. Like they want to present you this great information about the Thai curry house. But in order to do that, they need to get, they need to have that information come from Thai curry house, from their website. That's the way they get it right now. Um, so they're sort of both bypassing, in some ways, the website, as well as really super dependent on it. Anyways, uh, uh, so Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Twitter to some extent, but LinkedIn, uh, Amazon, like these big, these big ecosystems, Apple certainly, have, like, they're, they're holding the content and they want to keep you there, right? Um, so that's, that's what the idea is. And there's a, there's a lot of, again, dialogue happening around it, so, and you know, more articulate answers than that. But that's the basic concept. slides from where you are right now, at the bottom of one of your slides, you say, um, search and social will be regulated. I'm thinking about November 8th in this country, 2016, and if we're looking forward to 2020, can you expand on that a little more? Who exactly and how exactly do you imagine search and social being regulated? Because honestly, I got to say, looking at it from where we are now and from where we sit 
and imagining what November 9th is going to be like, I cannot imagine how that will happen by 2020. Um, well, I think, so governments, uh, as slow and ponderous as they are, uh, also react quickly when threatened. And I think for politicians to realize that Facebook could skew the election based on the kinds of articles they present, or Google to do the same, um, is going to be like sort of, that's the self-preservation button, or like the gene kicks in. Like, uh, and so I think, I, I think very specifically related to elections, uh, that is what will push these things forward. Again, like uh, as is happening, and again, we see it already happening in, in, uh, in, in um, European Union and sort of data privacy kinds of things, like that is really gathering steam and such. But I think uh, there's been like, and again, this is, this is not my own original idea, um, but there will be like some sort of al algorithmic oversight. Like Facebook must, you know, ha like the FDA, like actually Dries called this uh, something like the FDA of, of algorithms. Like there will be uh, basically some sort of oversight body which says you can't skew elections and also maybe some other stuff, but that's the one that's gonna motivate it. That's what I think. Again, at least one stupid thing in here, but. I'm putting that on the slide. <laughs> Five years. That's great, thank you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Chris? Uh, I have somewhat of a convoluted question, and it's a three-parter with uh, slides. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> it has to do with um, the open, a couple slides back, where uh, open web, Facebook, Yep. Okay. So if there's like an open web with Amazon, Google, Facebook, and I click on any of those and I'm basically looking at pants from somewhere, mm -hmm. and I go to Facebook and I've seen that on Amazon, and now Amazon is trying to sell me pants from Facebook in a screenless environment for 2020 web, how is it? that um, one, and then if you go forward with the Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. um, like how is the big data of me wanting to buy pants mm -hmm. through Facebook? I love on, the example. Yeah, thank you, uh, on Amazon, uh, with the convoluted cookies being passed back and forth in a screenless environment, I wonder do you, what, what prediction do you have in the pants buying metaphor of, of, of so, the, that environment? If, I mean, if that's... There's a, if there's that's, a lot of pieces. I'll try and take some of those pieces. All right, so okay. I think... So Facebook I, and Amazon, uh, again, like, there will be, I think, standards that emerge to, to solve this exact problem. And everybody's going to come up with their own until one of them starts pulling ahead. And then the rest of the group... Like, Google is not going to buy Apple. I, again, I'm, I'm just rife with, I'm sure, hyper-accurate predictions. But I don't think they're all going to buy each other. And that means there are going to be like forces, like sort of mediating forces. And if one of them just starts, you know, put, like being too big, I think the others are going to jump on board if we have something ready for them to jump on board with. Again, like the Web Standards Project, right? And so if we start thinking about that problem right now and start formulating, again, via the technology, this is how it should work. This is the way, you know, like here's the protocol. This is, you know, like, and have, you know, data security and other things in mind. Um, they will jump on board, uh, especially if one of them starts pulling away. Um, so, so that's like part of the answer. And then uh, uh, buying pants via voice is part of the question too. And I'm yeah. not sure what's that part. So, like. uh, so the first part was the data where mm -hmm. one of them will pull away. The second one is uh, the pants buying where I, I, where I don't really want to buy pants. I want the option presented to me. How do, how do you envision that happening in a screenless environment? Oh, uh, where, where, so where I'm, I'm asking uh, right. whoever for like sale on apples, and they say, "Oh yeah, apples are absolutely on sale." Buy some pants. I mean, is that <laughs> like in, in a screenless environment? How is that oh, going to be? Oh, got it. Right, 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 so, right, right, right. Then, where so is I'm, the... I'm rife with a sidebar about stuff that I've accidentally or intentionally looked on. You're you're, you're talking now, about sidebar content. Present itself yeah. in a screenless environment. Uh, End caps, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So, uh, yeah, where's the banner ad? Yeah, how do you yeah. do a banner ad? This, this uh, Apple update brought to you by pants. Pants. Um, uh, possibly, you know, like, uh, so look to radio. Like, um, again, like, 
so to like, oftentimes you can look back a ways. Like I haven't really thought about this very much, but I'll give you what, you know, okay. I'm thinking about it now, so I'll hip, give you I what I got. Um, I would say I would, look, I would look to the past. I would okay. say, how does radio do that now, right? Um, and it, it's like interstitial messages and bumpers and such. Um, and, you know, being aware, like, there's a little pre, you know, roll in and such, or podcasting or something like that. Again, and it's not necessarily, not every medium is going to be appropriate for every single thing. Like, so banner ads over audible uh, auditory <laughs> interfaces, probably not going to be super effective. I mean, yeah. some, but it's going to lend itself to different things, maybe. Cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm happy to keep talking.